Well, today I'm going to begin on the topic of optical fibers. It's a problem which is important, but the real reason is that I lived through the period when it arose became popular, and therefore I can tell you more or less what I did. It is typical of a situation you will meet many, many times. New areas come up. You have not the time or the energy to become an expert, but you cannot afford not to know. If you don't learn about some of these fields, the world will pass beyond you and you'll be left behind and rather unhappy. So this is really an example of how one particular topic I handled. Well, it begins by me noticing on the bulletin board that there is a talk on optical fibers going to be given. It's an interesting topic, but if you're going to work in a place like Bell Labs or MIT or someplace else, there's always interesting lectures going on, and uh, if you don't do your own business, you'll spend all your time learning something but never doing anything. So it's always a problem. Do I work on what I should be doing to help the company, or do I go out and learn something more so I'll be useful later on? Well, let's review what I knew before I went to the first talk. Having had lab courses, I knew you could draw glass out of very fine fibers. I also knew that they were very, very round because the surface tension of liquid glass is rather high, and so it grabs the smallest circumference, which means it's going to be circular. Another, I knew that optics was very high frequency as against electronics in those days and that the business of the telephone company was bandwidth. That's the name of the game. Clearly, there was much more bandwidth in optical frequencies than there are electronic frequencies. Tremendous amount more. So we could send more information. Lastly, I knew a curious fact that Alexander Graham Bell actually had built some equipment and sent a voice over a light beam. It was a big kludge thing, it was just light beam, wasn't class fiber, but he had done it, so it could be done. Oh yes, one more thing I knew. I knew about internal reflection, that if you come from water up to air, it'll come out, but there are angles which you go out and there's total reflection back, that if you look a sufficiently slant from below the surface of a smooth pond, the light will reflect it back into the water. Same way, if you're in glass and you have a very slow, a slight glancing angle, the light will be totally reflected back into the glass fiber. So you see immediately, when you think about that, you want a small fiber. You don't want a fiber to get a good size angle at the surface, but you want it so small it must always skim the edges. That's why we make small fibers. Well, I went to the talk because I said, it's bound to be important to the telephone company, and I'm bound to get problems on the subject to calculate, so I'd better know something about it. The first speaker said, God loved sand. He made so much of it. What I heard was, if we go to glass, we won't be like we are with copper. At present, even those days, we were mining poorer and poorer copper mines doing more and more work to get less and less copper. Well, you aren't going to run out of silica. Not likely. Uh, either the next lecture or the one after that, there was a guy who said, in the ducts underneath the streets and the sidewalks of New York City, uh, we have wires. And those are getting kind of crowded. And if the Manhattan grows as we expect it is, we'll have to dig up a lot of those and put a lot more down, and we'll dig up a lot of streets and sidewalks. But if we get glass fibers, we can pull out the big copper wires and put it in small glass fibers, and we can get along for a long time without digging up. Well, that says to me, Bell Labs, if it has to spend a million or a hundred million dollars to avoid digging up the streets of New York, it'll be a bargain. Bell Labs must work on glass fibers. Not they think it's nice, they have no choice. So I continued following it. Now, one of the things I had learned when I came to Bell, Bell Labs, after I decided to stay, that uh, in building electronic gear, 
which I tried building a few just to see how it went, you do a lot of soldering of wires. Well, you aren't going to solder glass fibers or just fuse them together. Glass fibers, you're going to have to bring them up end to end very, very carefully and keep that intersection contact very well done. So I promptly put my mind on how will they, in the field, not in the laboratory, in the field, splice glass fibers? Or will every fiber have to be exactly the right length for each use? Well, they came up with quite a few methods, as you know, and we've solved the problem reasonably well of splicing it. But I started looking for difficulties. Well, the first test was done down, as far as I remember, in Atlantic, connecting up two uh, central offices, just simply interconnecting with a glass fiber. And they ran 15 months or something, and it worked out very well. So it was sort of proved in. But then I noticed a curious thing. What they were doing was get the glass signal, glass fiber signal optically, detect it, bring it down to electronic velocity, uh, electronic frequencies, amplify it electronically, convert back to light, and go on. Now that has to be pretty rotten design. So I said to myself, they're going to have to build optical amplifiers. There's no way around it. They've got to do it. And I thought and asked a few physicists questions and decided there were a number of ways this might be done. Therefore, probably one of them would come through and we would have all optical fibers. So those are the kind of things that went on in my mind. Now, why do we want small ones? Because a small glass fiber, tenth of the diameter of hair, two things happen. In going down a big fiber, some paths can get longer than others if it bounces from sides. But if it's very, very thin, almost all paths will be the same length, so the various parts will not get out of phase as they go down the line. Secondly, as I go around a bend, if they're very thin, I can make much sharper bends than if it's large, thick. Not this bending glass, but it's a reflection on the outgoing that no photons will get out. Well, then I begin to think some more about these things. You know that it's not too hard to tap a telephone wire that's electronic. You put a coil around it, and you pick off the electric field, and you amplify it, and you can hang it on the guy's phone, and they don't know it's there. But optically, so few photons come out that you can't take the photons which escape and use them for anything. It's not that you could not, but it's going to be a very difficult technical feat to eavesdrop a glass fiber, where it's quite easy, the other one. And another thing, having done some work that I told you with these guys, the upper chemistry of the atmosphere, do atomic bombs, I was well aware of uh, electromagnetic impulses that come from there, which also come from lightning. Lightning strikes bother copper wires. Atomic bomb will bother the transmission on a copper wire, but they won't affect the glass fiber. So glass fibers had a lot of nice things that came out of it. Another one, there is what they call single mold and multi-mold. Single mold meant you used the basic fundamental frequency. The higher modes meant you used some varying versions of uh, Legendre functions and got the wave across there. So you could send in each one different modes and at the back end separate the modes out and get all those different messages down the same wire. There were some arguments. It was a detective one, but I bet on the single mode because I bet originally on the binary machine. We had tried building in the early days some decimal machines. You know all the machines are binary. Well, I bet on a single mode, and I think that's still what they're doing almost always. So that is sort of what happened along the way and what I thought about it. Now, several other things happened. It was clear to me that if you put a cladding on the outside of the glass, uh, you might affect it so more photons get out, which you don't want. You want to keep those photons in, and they've got to go down the line. There's very little loss, only the absorption of glass itself. Well, they had the idea of taking a good glass, sized glass rod, put a little another glass sleeve around it of a very different index refraction, heat them up so the outer one shrinks down a little bit. Now I've got this solid piece. 
I draw it out to a long glass fiber, and of course, that still stuff stays there, and I've got a very thin but definite layer of different index and the refraction is going to be, refraction is going to be happening inside throughout. They could have mirrored the surface, but they chose to do that. Then later on, they decided it was much better to produce a graded uh, change of index refraction rather than a smooth one, and which, if you stop and think about it, it's precisely the technique we use in psychotrons to get the beam focused. We put a graded field as so those that begin to deviate are begin to pull back. More deviation, more, but there's no sharp cutoff, just a tendency to bring them back all the way along. And that can be done either chemically or by radiation. And that's what, by and large, we now do for glass fibers. We either radiate or use some chemical methods to deposit some particles to make the glass a little different in its refraction so the beams are bent back and things that go very nicely for very long times. Now, Bell Labs have been working on making better glass, but once glass fibers began to end the business, the optical companies started getting really clear glass. Now, you would have thought they would have done that for the astronomers. They hadn't really. I am told that some of the glass they can make now is so clear that you could see the bottom of the Pacific Ocean from the surface. Almost no impurities, nothing bothers them. Now, of course, that depends on the frequency you're using. And since we had to use lasers, we had to pick our glass to fit the lasers, although slowly we are getting lasers in almost any band of frequency we want. But for a long while, we were restricted to those kind of lasers which we could make. So there you have the kind of a thing. Strong focusing is roughly what we use now to keep the beams in the middle of the beam. Yeah, let's see, I got along further than I thought I would. Well, all the parts, as you know, did come together fairly well. They are fairly light. Now, when I first came here, the department head, who had been a captain, was assigned as supply officer to the Enterprise, and he invited us for an afternoon and evening wandering around the ship, along with having dinner with the executive officer. I took the opportunity to look at the ducks. And I found all kinds of wires going through ducts, and sometimes there wasn't room to go through ducts, and they ran through doorways, which should have been closable in case of st storms. Well, it didn't take me long to figure out that insofar as those wires were carrying signals, we could replace them by glass fibers, and just as in the New York streets, we wouldn't have to make more deck holes. We simply put smaller wires in. Insofar as its power distribution, however, that's another story. So naturally, my mind says, oh, power distribution. At present, by and large, they seem always to put the power in the central power plant and distribute the power all over the ship. Will they continue? Would it not possibly be better that they would decide to have separate power supplies scattered around here, there, and yon, so no one was vulnerable? Because we're going to undoubtedly put a very redundant glass fiber system through. When there were copper wires, we couldn't. But the glass fibers are so small and have such great bandwidth, we will undoubtedly put alternate paths around from here to there. So that if great damage is done here, the path, another path will be available to get where you want. So long as the receiving end can take instructions, you want to send to them. And damage along the way you want to avoid, well, you want to avoid the power distribution too, so you may well decide finally you want many power supplies. I don't know, but it's clear that the glass fibers will replace on a battleship a lot of duct capacity, except insofar as power distribution. Now, on an airplane, the same thing, where the weight counts much more. The weight on the Enterprise wasn't that high. I could see that the weight of the copper versus glass would matter much. The Enterprise is just too big. In case you haven't been on it, it's big. Uh, for an airplane, however, it makes a big difference. We can greatly decrease the weight of connections. And we can also put redundant systems in so the signaling goes this way or that way to the airlines. In case some damage is done to part, we still can communicate by the other path or the other several paths. So one sees what's going to happen. 
Now, we have a thing which we call a drop cord in telephone business, which is from the telephone pole to the house. It used to be a line in the air. Now that many of them are buried, we still call them drop cords. The telephone company is obviously going to go to glass fibers because, you know, they're pretty darn cheap as against copper. Copper is quite expensive. With a good glass fiber, all the information your house can possibly consume could be put on one glass fiber. Your television programs, radio programs, newspapers, everything. As long as you had a print machine, you get the print. But whether that will happen or not is one of the topics which I've talked to a number of times. Legal reasons, the government not permitting various people to combine, and also the government may very well say at the back end, do we want all the information people can get in the hands of one organized group of people? Or do we in fact want to keep competing one so that every house has several paths in and no one has total control? I don't know. But you see that's a social problem which dominates the electronic problem. Electronically, putting one glass fiber and everybody sharing it, there's no problem. We know how to do it. What we don't know how to do is do the economics, the psychology, the politics, and so on. So I am not in a position to tell you what's going to happen. I can tell you what could happen, but that doesn't mean it's going to. And it's a very common thing, more and more, that we can do something engineering-wise very easily and very efficiently doesn't mean we're going to be allowed to do it. There are other reasons, as I said. Are you sure you'd like to have one company in control of all the distribution? And if a strike occurs, suddenly nobody gets any information? And so if nobody gets any information, there's going to be no telephone calls, there's going to be nothing except a small private radio to communicate. You might not want to do it. Now there's another thing you want to think about is satellites. Around the Earth, about 23 miles, 23 and a half thousand miles, right above the equator, there are a bunch of satellites. And they sit up there at that distance because it takes them 24 hours to go around the Earth. The Earth rotates 24 hours, so it sits above one position. But it's got to be right on the equator. We put them now about four degrees apart. Now, as we started putting them up, there were arguments. Countries on the equator said, hey, you're invading our airspace. Our airspace goes out to infinity. <laughs> well, the wealthier nations have ignored the question. But do they? It will have some effect one of these days. It's not a simple one. Now, we could put them possibly twice as spaced Price is fine, about every two degrees, but if we do that, the antenna on Earth broadcasting up to the satellite must have a much narrower beam so you make sure you hit that satellite. It's going to be much more expensive because if you spread over several, you're going to cause trouble. You've got to beam it up to that satellite. Now we can also, to some extent, increase the bandwidth, which we did for quite a while, but after a while, the atmosphere through which those signals must go limits the bandwidth you can do per satellite. Now compare glass satellites with glass fibers. A satellite is broadcast. It's broadcast back to Earth to everybody. It's a great broadcast device. Glass fibers are privacy. They go from here to there and it's very hard for anybody to tap. At present we are using some of this broadcast business for private uses, but I think that you will find in time that the satellites we use more for broadcast situations, radio, television, so on, and glass fibers will be used for private communication from one person to another. Because we're going to run out of bandwidth going up to satellites and back down again. We're just planning going around the bandwidth because you know how rapidly we're increasing the bandwidth available to you. We're going up to very great rates at how much available. As a child, we had radio, a few stations, and we had a telephone, not very much, and we had post, and once in a while a telegram, newspapers. We didn't have television and various other things. 
We didn't have lots of bandwidth that you now have and are consuming. And our avenues is going up very rapidly to get more and more bandwidth for everybody. I think you'll find that glass fibers will be the answer for private communication and the other will be for public. Now, you have the quarrel when you discover the telephone company used to, without thinking about it, not when you call the person, call the person. You call the position and hope the person was there. In fact, I once, having thought about that, made a remark to a vice president. I said, you know, you don't call people. You call positions and hope they're there. This was many years ago. He says, gee, you're right. I never thought of it. Well, now we are moving toward great bandwidth costs trying to call you wherever you are, personal telephones. Whether you want one or not is another question a lot of people do. It makes them feel very important. It's a goddamn constant eruption, is what some of us think also. We want to be left alone. It, different people, different things. Let them have what they want. But it's going to consume much more bandwidth and it's going to produce a great deal more trouble, and the satellites will probably be involved in that to some extent. Now, we have glass fibers transatlantic, and the one going down to Japan was a very interesting case. There's a thing called a soliton. It's got a peculiar property that it keeps its shape. It goes down the water. It doesn't change shape. Now, if I send pulses down electric wire, there's dissipation and spreading out of the pulse and so on. Solitons keep their shape. They may shrink inside, but they keep their shape. They were first observed, oh, 1700 or 1800 in a canal in Scotland. The guy noticed this, and he galloped his horse for 50 miles and saw this wave go down there. And in fact, when my wife and I were up in Nova Scotia, and I was giving some talks there. We went out of our way to watch a soliton come up a famous river. It comes up there, goes up this, and it goes up the river, swies around bands and so on. It's just one nice little raise like that. They had been known for a long while, but they were not being exploited. A guy at Bell Labs, a friend of mine, thought that instead of sending pulses, we should communicate by solitons. Solitons the shape depends upon the nonlinear features of the medium which it goes through, and you can, to a fair extent, amplify a soliton without changing its shape. You simply put some indium or something else up there, you put an excited state, and the thing goes by, and lo and behold, the thing is amplified. So we have now the possibility, which is curious. We use amplification 10 or 20 stages, and then we stop and reshape or relay, relay a pulse. Now, the time when we were putting down the cable to Japan, my friend had gotten reasonably high rates of solitons, but he was just starting a technique. And the pulse signaling had been long, long developed. The question came up, which one were they used? And I never followed which one they used, because it may well have been just as it did with us on the first voice cable across the Atlantic. Transistors have been invented, but vacuum tubes were known to be reliable. So <laughs> we put down three vacuum tubes every 50 miles across the Atlantic uh, from uh, Nova Scotia to Scotland or Ireland, and uh, they had to have a 20-year life. Any failed tube that really failed was going to cost us a million dollars. Well, except for the Russians cutting a cable twice, by accident, you understand. Just They were just fishing, and they just cut it by accident. It's the accepted theory. You can't say anything. It's the accepted theory. It was an accident. Uh, except for that, nothing happened at all. No failure. Except there was a little bit of bending. The gain at some frequency is a little higher than expected because the temperature to use at the bottom of the ocean was a little different than what they thought. At the end of 22 years, we cut that cable off. It was so technologically obsolete that it wasn't worth running. We put in glass fibers since then. And we're putting in glass fibers now most places. Very, very thin. You people have them. Uh, we made glass fibers shielded with steel around them so you would run trucks and tanks over them. If they're lying in the road, you would run them over them and it won't stop it. It won't break the glass fiber. We have glass fibers so thin that you can fire them as a rocket 
and the thing unreels and you get not only a picture of what the rocket is seeing, but you can also control it. There's two-way communication up and down the glass fiber until it arrives, of course, then everything is busted. Glass fibers have come a long way. We are moving towards solitons almost certainly, which says, I hope to you, all the stuff you learned in electrical engineering about frequency and frequency analysis and so on isn't appropriate for future communication. Solitons are not frequencies. They're a different device entirely. And they're one of the many things I want to call your attention to. You can't afford to become an expert in solitons. You can't afford not to keep track of them. We are, by and large, putting in solitons in our cables. We're also doing another curious thing, which you may not know about. Let's take Africa, the whole continent. What we have done is we've laid a cable in the ocean, running around the whole continent, fairly f far offshore. Offshore far enough, so we're not going to get any trouble with people on shore. When we pass a country which has a coastline, we send a separate cable in, splice off a cable, send some messages in. Each country on the edge of the ocean gets a message from the central city directly, and nobody else can snoop or do anything else along the way. Those inland, well, it's got to go over their land. There's something else again. But we're doing that trick. Now, the reason is very simple, as I intimated. You don't have to dig up a bunch of things or disturb houses or anything else when you lay a cable in the ocean. Furthermore, you don't have much squabbling if you lay it out for 40 miles or 30 miles out. It's very easy to lay. We have things now which go along and dig a hole uh, a rut in and lay the cable and pull the dirt over on top of it so it's not laying bare right on the surface. We've learned how to arm them against most kinds of sea. And so we are doing that trick. And I would suspect, if it proves as successful as I think it will, that this is what we'll do by and large. We'll rim all the continents with big high duty cables running around them in the sea. And then splice out and send in messages that you're entitled to last 20 or 30 miles to your shoreline, then it's your business. The country then can do what it wants with the thing. So that's one of the things I think is coming up for sensible reasons, Debbie. Economics at the bottom. You don't get an argument with laying a cable. Try laying a cable across the United States. How many farms are you going to have to cross Kansas? On? How much trouble are you going to have? A lot. But we used to lay cables that big. If I put a fair number of glass fibers in a cable, armor it heavily, and lay it once, I've got an incredible bandwidth. And it may well be that we will put a set of north-south, east-west cables fundamentally across the continent, paying the price to lay them once, and not have to lay them again in your lifetime because we just put down so much excess capacity. Now, we always do this with wires, but a cable that big, Half as big is a lot of difference. Glass fibers, twice as much doesn't matter anyway, because they're all a tenth of a diameter of a hair. Who cares? So that's one of the things you're going to see. Now, being in computers, I naturally ask myself, what's going to happen about computers? I suppose you know already that we are occasionally connecting various units on the floor with glass fibers. Although sometimes we do it by effectively radio across the tops. Infrared signaling, much as some things work with trying to signal uh, your television set. Some work by electric signals, some work by infrared, and so on. Uh, but now, if, as I said, glass has got great bandwidth, and bandwidth is the name of the game because it's really speed, when I say speed, I don't mean the velocity of light is faster. I mean I can get more bits in the same length of time. That's what I mean by fast communication. More bits in the same length of time. And light has clearly got much more frequency than electricity. And if I got fast bandwidth, I got faster computing elements. And if I haven't, I haven't. And we've been pushing against a pretty difficult situation. Will optics help a lot? Can we make chips? in which instead of having soldered metallic paths, we have optical paths. 
Let me draw you a picture of one. Here is a photo cell. I happen to have, and you probably have seen, a hand calculator with no battery. So long as the light is shining on it, the power from that thing runs it. You've seen them have, right? Well, I put the circuit here. I power it from here. I do not do power distribution, wire to each one of the circuits. I put a light bulb. The light falls on all the chips. All the chips are locally powered. I get out of these costs of distribution. I get out of the trouble between distribution. Now I can do something else. I can put another chip here. And we've done things like this before. I can, instead of going from here to here, I can send a light beam up to there and put the next piece of circuit up there. And when I need it, come back down here. Now, light beams, if they are not too intense, go through each other. So instead of having a lot of wiring on this surface here, which, by the way, chips are just loaded now. Most of the acreage on chips is wiring, not active elements. I can put the wiring up this way. I can get a tremendously higher density of parts. And I don't have to pay the price of power distribution. I just put a good-sized light bulb in. I let it shine. Power distribution take care of. Two chips carefully bounded, carefully set up, so they beam this way back and forth, focusing up and down with a very small glass lens. And I can get a tremendous higher density of parts without so much acreage going into wires from here to here to here. It's definitely going to do it. I can build the whole thing out of glass. These can be glass things, and these can be optical switches instead. I didn't say we're going to do it. I say there's one of the possibilities, because I ask myself, what will it mean to computing? Now, another one I want to get you to think about. We have a crossbar switch, which connects a bunch of any one of 10 wires to any one of 10 wires down here, 12, something like that. That's the essential way we've been switching for years and years and years. Now, let me go back to the history of computing. When we began, memory was awful expensive. Ah, we had 12 registers, 15 registers, and the great von Neumann machines, 2,000. As memory got cheaper, we could build then big monitor systems, Fortran compilers and so on. But if you've already got 2,000 registers, you're not going to be able to do those kind of things. So the fact that memory came down in cost change the way we use machines. But switching is still a dog will problem. But I can picture 100 by 100. Another plate above. I'll put it sideways. A Fresnel lens here. You know what a Fresnel lens is. You see them in uh, lighthouses and so on. And you see them a lot of other places too. A Fresnel lens there, so this one is focused there and so on. And what I can do, presumably, is put a optical piece here. If I put a charge on it, it bends the light. I put another one in the other direction, put it, bends the light. So by putting two charges, one on this one and one on one above it, I can change the path where it hits up here. I can change the path from here. I can build, I think, with time. 10,000 to 10,000 switch. The telephone company, again, has to work on it. It's too gorgeous. It can be nice and compact. 10,000 lines is a central office. I can do all the switching in a little thing like that. They've got to work on it. If they perfect it, how will you design a machine when I give you something like this, uh, switching, is the cheapest element out. After all, the telephone companies manufacture their own use. So you buy a couple from them. Okay, they charge you 5000 or $10,000. The switching 
would now change the nature of computing again. I say switching, uh, computing was changed completely when we got much more memory. If you get the price of switching down low, it has been the high part for a long, long while. If you bring that down to be very cheap, how will you design a computer? What will you do? Well, these are reasons why you want to look forward and do these things. I have not majored in glass fibers. I have done nothing but sit in the sidelines, read a little bit, and use my imagination a little bit so that I would not be left behind if this happens. If that does happen, I am prepared to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I thought about that. Yeah, yeah, that's not so surprising after all. I will not be caught left behind. I want to come back to exactly, the, let's see if there's anything more I can do. I told you at the very beginning, the purpose of this talk was to tell you how one person coped with the field of optical fibers. I did not spend any great amount of time. I did no experiments. I thought at odd moments we'll walk the streets and various other things, and I thought about the nature of this and that. This is not the only new technology that's come up in my lifetime. In fact, my study of great contributions, when I ask, did you take a course in that? No, they had not. I've told you repeatedly, that which you learn from others, you can use to follow. That which you learn for yourself, you can use to lead. The leaders who do the new things almost always do it based upon knowledge which they acquired for themselves, more or less. They didn't do all the experiments, but they kept up with things and saw possibilities. They went out and did it first. If you do it second, you might as well forget it. You either come in first or you don't come in first. We don't in life pay off very much for uh, place and show. We play for win. The person who comes to with it first usually is a man of matter. The first person who articulates well an idea is the man who makes the contribution. Now, yes, there must be thousands of people who rally around the idea and accept it and act on it. But the leader is the guy who has the idea and articulates it carefully. And notice the second part. The history of science shows that a lot of people had ideas. They did not get them across. They rotted and had to be rediscovered. I told you in the past Fourier transform. If I didn't, I should have. It went back to Gauss. You see elements a lot of pieces. They didn't exploit it. When Tukey really got after it, when the time was ripe, he did it. But now it's in wide, widespread use. Well, my problem is exactly this. You will see a lot more than I did of new innovations. The pace of technology is indeed increasing. I had trouble keeping up. You're going to have more trouble. But if you will not keep up, two things are true. You'll be left behind, and you will not be one of the leaders. You won't be one of the people who matter. And my task is to make you people who will matter. Plain and simple. Therefore, I've got to get you to be more open-minded and more aware of without taking time away from your main job. You have a main job now, typically. You've got to do it in spite of it. I told you a number of things. I warned you about wavelets. And I guess I did one at a time. And here I'm, war war I'm warning you about solitons as different methods of analysis and signaling. And the stuff we taught you in classical electrical engineering, all on a frequency approach, may be a fading thing. We're not doing that now. And what you do in the frontier of shipping signals across to Japan or other places by solitons, quickly will come up with the question, why am I converting from solitons back to pulses? Well, why not keep the solitons going all the way? Well, pretty soon, the solitons are arriving in your house. And that's what's going to control the equipment. Now, just how it's going to be done, I don't know. I've thought about several things. With a glass fiber coming to your house, you want to do many things. Something to radio, something to television, something to do this or that. One can build filters, a digital filter, and all I have to do is throw in different digits in the digital filter to get this bandpass that I want. 
So each instrument, each thing you get has got a bandwidth of a given allocation. Those numbers are put in, you get that. Change the numbers, you got the other one. It could be that way, or it could be that the equipment you buy comes with its own filter automatically built in, and all you do is just plug it in, and you don't even think. Now, that's more wasteful of equipment, but it's easier on the human being. There's less thinking. How, if I did the, I had a general digital filter and I shared them all, how did those numbers get into the general filter for the particular new instrument you bought? If the instrument you bought comes with the filter attached to the end, then the cable goes in and it filters out what it wants. I'm inclined to think the second is what will happen because not that it's cheaper in money, in that sense, it's cheaper in human effort because humans cannot cope with all the kind of knowledge. Uh, you know the saying I've said several times, children can run VCRs, old people can't. And you can verify for yourself. Very few old people can run a VCR. A kid of six walks in, bing, 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 he's got the VCR working. It's hard. You're going to face the same thing. And I'm pleading with you not to let yourself become obsolete, because if you become obsolete, not only is your career shot but your life in some sense is. I think I may have told you, if I haven't, I'll tell you again. A friend of mine who taught me much about analog computers, I learned much from him. He was as smart as I was, though he didn't have a doctor's degree, but that doesn't matter. Doctor's degrees don't make you smarter. He was tied to the analog, and he would not really convert to digital. He really wouldn't do it. He was left behind. Management managed to find some other jobs which were interesting and he was capable of doing some things. But finally, management made it worthwhile for him to retire early. I retired early, as you know, to come here, do something exciting. Well, we had met on a few occasions. We changed cards until he died. Uh, he was somewhat disgruntled. His memory of his life, he was really squeezed out and he knew, never mind, they gave him extra money and it made it nice to quit, all those nice things. He could not avoid knowing that he was squeezed out and the laboratories went on without him. I left at a time of my own choosing. I'm not guaranteeing you they wouldn't throw me out the next day, but I left before. I advise you always, if you're going to change jobs or do something else like that, do it at a time of your own choosing if it's only 10 seconds before you have to. It makes an enormous difference of how you see your life when you seem to have done the things you want to do instead of doing things you had to. And I'm coming down to the main theme of this thing. You are going to have to learn a large number of things or you're going to be plain obsolete. And if you're obsolete, well, maybe you can enjoy fishing the rest of your life. I don't know. But I find it, my life is so much better than my friends. Uh, well, he died anyway, so I can't follow all the way through. But I've seen other ones the same way. It's a very much... You being what you think is in control of your life, which means you do keep up. Again, I did not spend a great deal of time on optical stuff. I watched do seminars here and there. I read literature occasionally. I noticed. But I was by no means an expert. But I did think about how it would affect my life. I've made projections. Some of these have not yet come true. 100,000 100, by 100,000 switch. I'm not sure they won't do it. 100, 100 cells by 100 cells. A couple of little things here which will bend the light this much or that much. We know how to build those things. Boom. You've got this switching thing. It could change the nature of computation. It could change the nature of an enormous number of problems. That means you have to think about it. Now, if you are aware of these things in advance, somewhere in the back of your mind, says, yeah, you know, you know, if we had that, this vexing problem in the company could be solved that way. You win. If somebody else can buy it and installs it, uh, you lose. Have I got the message across to you? See you next week then on, next week is beginning with computer aided instruction. How much you teach you, how much computers can help teach you? We got two pages. Well, today's lecture 
is on Computer Aided Instruction, which is often abbreviated CAI. When computers first appeared, they were very mysterious things, and comparatively few people could either understand them or cope with them or use them in any way. So it was natural that a fair number of machines turned up in university circles where that's their business. And since teaching is a business also, it was not very long before the questions arose, can we use computers to aid in teaching? It's a very, very natural question to arise, although it's surprising how many professors in universities never think about the question of teaching. Now there's a story from ancient Greek times to Alexander the Great that there was no royal road to geometry. Yes, there were royal roads which he could walk on. There were royal roads for his messengers to go up and down. But there was no royal road to geometry. Everybody had to do it the same. It's very, very much like running a mile in four minutes. There really isn't some easy way. Coaching and money will help a little bit, but basically there is no easy way. And this goes back to 300 and some BC. Now there's a long history of people wanting to know without the pain of actually learning. In the Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, for example, he discusses a method which was sleep learning. They put a microphone underneath your pillow and as you slept, the microphone gently said things like the Nile is the longest river in Africa and so on. Well, he points out what happens and how it doesn't work. Now, one of the years I was at Bell Labs, just when I don't know, but it was fairly early on, uh, there was a thing called Dianetics that appeared. It first appeared in a science fiction magazine, and later on it appeared in more popular places, and there are now institutes. In fact, last time I went through Santa Cruz, I think there was still an institute there on Dianetics. The idea was that it would somehow rather, in your words, clear your mind of all the mistakes, and then you would never again reason falsely. Well, it's still around, but by common consent, most of us don't believe it works. <clears throat> and indeed, of all the methods you read about, and all the methods you read in books about rapid reading or this or that, it's easy to observe that people who've gone through that do not dominate the world. For example, meditation is supposed to be good for you. Well, do you observe that the leaders in the society, in any particular sector even, are heavily people who meditated? If not, uh, meditation isn't the way to success, if that's what you want. Now, meditation may do something else, make you happier another way. And some of these other courses may make you happier another way. But in success in the real world as measured in the past, there have been no royal roads, in spite of all the advertising you hear and so on. Yet, that cannot be a proof there will not be one tomorrow, or in particular, given a machine with all its abilities, can we combine normal learning with a computer to speed up or make easier or do anything to help the process of learning? It's a perfectly legitimate question. It's one which you cannot afford to ignore. Now, before I get into this business, I have to discuss another very important factor, which is neglected. It should be part of your education. It's called the Hawthorne effect. It's named after a plant of Western Electric at Hawthorne. Some Bell Lab people, psychologists, said, well, let us see if we can improve productivity by various methods, such as painting the walls a pleasant color. So they went into a plant, took a room, and painted the walls pink, and sure enough, productivity rose. They changed the lighting to a softer lighting, and productivity rose. They changed this to that, and productivity rose. Everything they did productivity rose. And one of them got suspicious and quietly reestablished pretty much the original conditions. Productivity rose. 
Why? The Hawthorne effect. If the people working for you believe you care, they will respond better than if you don't. If I come into class and tell you I'm teaching by a new wonderful method, you respond by being more attentive. And the teacher responds because it's a new method. They are more excited. So lo and behold, the class performs better because I'm using a new method. The method may, in fact, be worse, but the Hawthorne effect will make it look better. And this is what happens to a great extent. When you're reasonably good, changes by and large will be bad. But with the Hawthorne effect, make almost any change look better than what you were doing. Until it becomes an established method, and then you go right back to having lost the effect. Now this vitiates almost every study of teaching. Unless they make allowance for the Hawthorne effect, you cannot depend upon the conclusions. No way. It's a very, very real phenomenon. It's not a small one. Now, if you think you allow for it, I remind you of the lecture last week on the double-blind experiment, why the doctors finally were driven to doing double-blind experiments. In a way, that is partially the effect of a Hawthorne effect. It is that people anticipate and so they respond better, both the doctors and the patients. The same way, the students and the professor will both respond better by a new method of teaching. My conclusion from all this is the best method of teaching is probably one which is constantly changing. So the students think it's new and the prop thinks it's new and the Hawthorne effect produces better learning. Not that there's anything behind it except this subconscious expectation, which in the learning process is almost everything. Now let me talk about one of the first methods of using uh, machines. You understand a professor has got to grade papers, particularly in a more elementary course, there's a lot of course grading, keeping records and so on. So one professor built what he called the grader. You're assigned in the course a bunch of problems. The professor takes those same problems, writes out how to calculate the answers, and he also adds what is the range of input variables, how, what range can x be, for example, must it be a positive integer or something, and what is the leniency I will give you in not being exactly right, how many digits must you get right? So all he's got to do is write the same problem, and from term to term he can change. Now when you think you've got it going right, you call the grader. The machine generates some random data, runs it through your problem, through the professor's problem. If they agree, you pass. If they don't, you're wrong. And it enters it automatically into the professor's private file. Now we can also measure, if you want, the number of instructions, or this or that, or how much machine time it took, and so on. The, and he can also, whenever he wants, to deliver averages, variances, and so on, both over the whole single exam, over the whole class, or one single student over a whole set of exams. He can do all kinds of things very, very rapidly. Now, it can be changed term to term. All the professor has to do is to change the problems, Submit his new solutions and the ranges, and there he is. Very flexible. Well, it sounded good to me. About three years later, I was back on campus to give some of a speech, dedication, and I inquired about it. Wasn't in use. Why? Well, they had changed the monitor system of the machine, and so some small change would have to be made in the grader, and nobody did it. Struck me as rather odd. So, since I frequently went to universities, I started inquiring, and I found this happened many times. Somebody would build a program which would greatly decrease the apparent mechanical labor the professor had to grade papers or keep records and so on, but they were not used very long. They fell out of use. So that idea, although it sounds very, very attractive, seems not to be widely used. 
And I think the reason is that subconsciously you recognize that machine learning lacks something. And to get that in your head clearly, I go back to my own experience on the matter. Back in the early 40s, when I was at Illinois, engineering school, big one, there was at any one hour of the day at least one calculus class for differential calculus and one for integral calculus. And sometimes there'd be two sections at the same hour. That meant an awful lot of professor contacts. So I said to myself, if I were to build a huge thick book like this, backing up your calculus text, every time you're stuck, there it is. If I produce movies of professors giving lectures and carefully prepared ones, if I gave you all kinds of backup, would not the thing be better for the students? They could learn at their own time. They wouldn't have to meet the class hours. They could go in and call the film when they want. They can study when they want to. They got flexibility. Wouldn't it be better? Well, if it'd be better for calculus, it'd be better for bing, bing, bing. Suppose we try it for the whole university, maybe excluding gymnasium and sports, but otherwise we do it all. Then you ask yourself, if your child went to college for four years and never had a professor, would you consider that an education? You say no, and suddenly you realize that education to a great extent includes human contact and learning to adjust to social situations. That the machine education lacks very badly a human contact, which is a great deal of learning. Learning to get along with other people, learning to get along with professors who had crazy ideas, how do you adjust to them? Professors who have different ways of thinking, how do you learn to listen and follow them? This is part of what is going on in school. And therefore, the mechanization of education leaves something to be desired very much. You can call it, if you wish, my favorite word, the socialization of the human person. Lack of socialization is very serious. Two of the smartest mathematicians out, one of them is dead now, uh, were educated at home. Both of them had rotten human relations. Both of them had a very, very poor feeling of how other people felt, acted, and thought. Yes, they learned more. They were geniuses. Both of them well-recognized geniuses. They did tremendous work. But also, they had never been socialized at the time when they should have been, and later years, never socialized. But I worked with one of them for many years, for 10 years or something, and he just lacked social things. In fact, the other day, I was talking to a friend on the phone who also knew him quite well, and we both agreed that he just was not, he could not understand other people because he had not been socialized. He'd been allowed to learn on his own with a private tutor. Now, I want to talk to another project called Plato. This is a big project went on for years at the University of Illinois with a big computer, and a friend of mine was running it. I would meet him at various meetings, and one time I took a long flight on the same plane and we talked. He said, one time Plato had a student from Scotland, one from Canada, and one from Kentucky. And I said to him, I know the telephone company can connect them up. That has nothing to do whatsoever with how good is the system. None whatsoever. What I want to know is, do the students learn more, better, faster? Well, the contention was, with no real evidence, they learn 10% faster. So I said to him, does that mean that it's 10% all the way along? Or does it mean each course is 10% so that each year I'm sort of saving one month? At the end of 24 years, I'll be two years ahead. He didn't know. He never had any data that I could see that proved anything other than his assertions, that the students liked it, whether this was that, or a lot of students were here, there, and yon. Later on, when I was at Irvine, it happened that a young a lady, not so young anymore, who had worked for me at Bell Labs and left, and she was now divorced and working with a professor on educating for physics. And so I got to see the inside. The professor had a good idea, but the programs being written for the computer to deliver to the student were written not by him, but by the stooges, by the people below, the less imaginative people, not the really smart guy. Well, 
the lessons look like what you'd expect them. And this is often what happens. That the professor is so busy raising money and doing other things and managing a project that the professor does not do the actual writing and presenting, presenting the material to the student, but rather is left to less able people. And so you get what you'd expect. Now, once I was editor, chief editor of all the ACM publications, and a program book came in for publication. A program book is about the following. A question is asked. Depending upon your answer, you are sent to one place or another. Now, if you've got the right answer, you're sent on. If you've got the wrong answer, one type, you're sent over there, and it gives an explanation, then you're sent back. If you another different wrong answer, you're sent over there. And you can see how it's going to work. In principle, the guy who knows everything reads right straight through and passes. The student who's somewhat ignorant is sent on many of these other trails to get reinforcement and learning until they can get their way through. Now, it's bound as a book, but it's not a book. You can't browse it. If you remember seeing something yesterday, you can't leave your way back easily because you don't know what branches you came from. Now, modern disks do the same thing, and you might there put it in, in the machine. As you go down the thing, the machine could record for you just what path you came down so you could browse back. So it, that worst feature at that time can be mitigated bit, a bit by computers with a fair amount of memory to track. Well. I didn't want to go on my own judgment, so I trotted down to the social science department and found a guy there who did know the subject. Now, that was the great thing about Bell Labs. you got a problem. <laughs> There's somebody around there who knows. For example, I was putting in a waterfall in the backyard. And I needed a pump. I go down to some place. I get some reference. I go down and talk to the guy, and he tells me all about pumps. He tells me just about how much I have to have and where I can buy the damn thing. That was the nice thing about Bell Labs. There's always an expert. But this guy... Not only told me what he knew, but he said, look, the next week there's a conference on program learning. Why don't you go? So why not? I go, and it happens I sit down next to him the first morning, and he nudges me and said, watch. He says, no one will ever produce any real evidence. They will all talk about how good it is, how wonderful it is, and so on. There will be no real hard evidence. And he was right. There wasn't one drop of it. You were told why it would be good and everything else like that, but genuine experiments allowing for the Hawthorne effect, forget it. They were not there. Well, I reject the book, and on hindsight, I don't think I did wrong, but I'm not sure, of course. Now, another terrible fact about those kind of things comes out when you watch. And since if it's on a machine, you can watch by various methods, namely, you can arrange that your computer is following what the student's computer has or it can record, or various other things. It can snoop very well. It is found the following, that the good student looking at the answers will take what he knows is a stupid answer merely to find out what on earth the book is going to say. Out of boredom, the good students frequently will pick the wrong answer, knowing it's wrong, just to see what the book's going to say about it. Is it going to say, boy, were you stupid, didn't you think about this or that? They do it out of amusement because they're bored. Therefore, the claim that the better students will get through faster is not really true. The better students wander around too, but they wander around for a different reason. So it really isn't true what you think is going to happen with this wonderful idea that each student will go at their own pace. It doesn't work out. Now, I didn't, let's see. I've given you some of the negative side. Now, let's talk about the positive side of CAI. I think few of you would disagree that if your child has to memorize the multiplication table one digit by one digit, then a computer which takes them through with problems, notices that they have trouble with sevens, or when the first digit is larger than the second digit, or maybe when it's first, first digit is less, it files away gradually the pattern of trouble the student is having, and then deliberately produces problems designed to test that part. I think most of you will probably agree that the student may very well learn better. Although children are human, the reinforcement from an adult or a parent that you got it right or wrong is more effective than a machine telling you you're right or wrong. So even then there may be some doubt, but I think most of you would agree that at that low level of real rote mechanical memorization 
probably machine learning can be made somewhat better if it's done intelligently. It can sort of tailor learning to the difficulties the person is having within some latitude. Let me go to another one. I've used it several times. We have pilot trainers. There, I don't think any of you will disagree that the pilot learns far faster and far better with a pilot trainer than he will ever learn with real planes. Because we can run them through many experiences which might risk their life and other things. It might risk ruining a plane. Uh, and we do it so realistically that the pilots come out sweating. But we give them a wide range of experience. Now, there again, while there is some brains in piloting, much of it is trying to get a conditioned response so the pilot will respond instinctively to the situation. Now, I happen as a child, I took up fencing. You have to parry the thrust without benefit of thought. When he lunges, you've got to parry without thinking. There isn't time. That doesn't mean you don't have a plan for fencing. But you have to get fencing down so that you throw your wrist back and forth without benefit of thought. You have to re and much of life requires this kind of a thing. Driving a car sooner or later becomes you have to yank the wheel or put your foot in the brake instinctively without stopping to think. There is a great deal of that. Now, machines may very well help in those areas to some extent. And after all, we do have machines. My neighbor down the street bit, bought a machine with uh, pitch baseballs at the child so baseball, the child could practice batting. We do have these kind of things around for certain kinds of practice, which are mechanical and instinctive. They've got to be brought down to that level where you don't think, you just do like running an abacus. If you're oriented, you learn to learn an abacus, flick the beads. The flicking the beads is done more or less here, not up here. They learn how to do it by so much practice. Now, when I first came to Naval Postgraduate School, there was a dean. I still go to lunch with him. He quit being a dean now, thank God. He was concerned with extension division education. And since I came from Bell Labs where I'd learned system engineering. I was coming here. I started looking at education as a system, as a whole. What in hell are we trying to do? What is the educated person? So on. Well, he and I used to have some rather hot arguments. One day I walked in his office and said, Dean, I'm teaching a weightlifting class. Now, he knew I was not. And I said, graduation lifting 250 pounds. I find the students get discouraged, they drop out, they repeat the course, and very few graduate. But last night I had a real good idea, I said. I'll cut the weights in half. They will lift up 125 pounds, set them down. Lift up 125 pounds, set them down. They've lifted 250 pounds. They graduate. I waited for him to smile, as you're sort of saying, that's ridiculous. And I said, since he had once been the head of the math department, if I find an easier proof of a theorem, have I cut the weights in half? Have I? If I make learning easier, am I cutting the weights in half? Am I not in some sense trying to develop your mental muscles as you are trying to develop your physical muscles? You're lifting weights is only a means to an end. You really didn't want to get those weights lifted and dropped down again any more than when you run a mile. You want to get around that mile because you end up where you started. It wasn't running the mile that you wanted to accomplish. It was what the mile running implied about other aspects of your life. In the same way, weightlifting. By and large, unless you want to be a weightlifter, lifting weights is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. You accomplish nothing. You lift them up and set it back down again. No progress. It's what it does to you. In the same way, if I do not somehow rather develop your mental muscles, am I doing my job? I suggest there's the part that is very, very difficult to cope with. Now, don't interpret the conclusion immediately that I favor bad lecturing. No, but transparently good lecturing is not necessarily good. And the two examples are Feynman and uh, Fermi. 
Hyman's book on physics you can get still. So very, very colorful, brilliant lecturer. Very good man. But you know, you really won't learn how to do physics that way. He skates around troubles like that and gives you colorful, brilliant answers for just the situation he's giving you. Fermi was even worse, I think. I caught him one sequence lectures one time at Los Alamos. He said, well, the log of infinity is 20, and goes ahead. Log of infinity is 20. One time he said, well, log of infinity is 10, and went ahead. Without one word of explanation, why did he shift from 20 to 10? Well, my friend Metropolis, who was at Los Alamos with me, and went back all the way. He was in Chicago for a while, and he used to go in, so he said, to a lecture by Fermi. He would have a pad of paper, and he was going to take notes. And everything Fermi said was so brilliantly clear that when he came to leave, there was nothing on the sheet of paper. But when he got back to his office and tried to think, Fermi had gone around the troubles like this, and he didn't notice what Fermi was avoiding, and he fell in the first hole. Many so-called brilliant lectures, in fact, do this. They carefully avoid the trouble, and they make you feel like you've been taken through a beautiful scenic trip. Yes, you have been. But is that really educating you? Or is it entertaining you? I claim that there are two aspects of education. You have to know about them. Now, I gave you a rule several times. But I'll give it to you again. That which you learn from others, you can use to follow. That which you learn for yourself, you can use to lead. I have found it being very, very true when I examined other people. I didn't make that thing up. I talked to a great many people. What made them do this, that, and the other thing? And again and again, I found that what enabled them to do that great creative act was something they had studied on their own and really knew. Now, there's two problems. One is, to what extent shall I justly compare mental muscles with physical muscles? Both of them apply the ability to do something difficult. I'm trying to build up your ability to cope with difficult things, and I think in that sense, it's a reasonable thing to talk about. Now, another argument I have with the same dean, he had these extension divisions, and he was perfectly willing to let an extension student drag on as long as the student wanted to complete the course. And I said, nonsense. You don't want the chief of staff to be a slow learner. You want to be a pretty fast learner. Not that fast is everything. But people take a very, very long time to learn. We don't really want to promote very far. We want people who are rapid learners and can use their brain rapidly to be in charge. So that contrary to what he said, I maintain that by God, the ability to learn fairly rapidly was an important part of getting education. Now the fundamental trouble with CAI and all of education is very, very simple. I cannot tell you what the education person is, nor can you. I can only tell you one thing, that in a discussion with you about what the education person, educated person is, your definition will turn out that you're educated. What we're trying to do, we don't know. How we do it, if we do it, we don't know. We keep thinking that we turn out some educated people, because after all, we turned you out and you're educated. We turned out me, I must be educated. We really don't know what we're doing, so how can I possibly measure whether the machine is doing successfully? But far worse, as I've emphasized you regularly, what the education person is today is not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in you in the year 2020. Roughly. I'm interested in educating you for your future, which I don't know. I have only been trying to give you some clues in this class, a vague idea of what the world will be like in 2020. I'm fairly confident that you'll have laptop computers available in class, book size, with storage such that the, the whole damn course is on one disk. In fact, it may be all a Textbooks that you're going to use for that term are on the disk you carry right in your class, right with you anytime. 
how can the professor go on lecturing the facts when it's all there? Furthermore, how can he go on lecturing on the methods? Take, for example, calculus, which is one of my favorite ones. I've taught here a lot of times, although they won't let me do it anymore because they want their own department to teach it to keep their own department employed. Somewhere in the 60s, a blind programmer at MIT named Slagle wrote a program that would do analytic integration. That, that is, given sine x dx, it would give you out minus cosine x plus constant. That's what I mean by analytic integration. It would do about as well in range of what it could do as the MIT undergraduate could do, and it could do it about the same cost as a student. Now, this was done in the old world when it was just a slow machine. Obviously, with greatly decreased cost of machine and greatly increased capacity, we now have programs which will beat anybody at doing analytic integration at cheaper than you can put your pencil to paper and get away with it at any reasonable cost. But we're still teaching you analytic integration. Why? Well, when I write You learn that. That's the basic one you learn. But I give it in a neural disguises. X now becomes sine x. That's the cosine x dx. This becomes some other expression. That's another one. I give it in a thousand disguises. And you've got a whole bunch of forms. So when you see an integral in my class, you have to recognize an underlying pattern. That's the trouble. You have to recognize an underlying pattern. This is something that I do deliberately. I give you such variety you cannot memorize your way through. Now, a lot of people memorize your way through a lot. For example, a friend of mine who's a PhD says that when he took calculus at Harvard, he learned how to do the delta process to find the derivative, but he did not understand what it was. He just learned how to do it. He got an A in the course, he could do it, but he really didn't know what he was doing two years later. Many students in mathematics are able to memorize their way through and do it without a glimmer of an idea of what is going on. Well, here, if you're going to get through my course, you're going to learn pattern recognition. You're going to learn it's a very difficult thing. In fact, in some sense, it's a measure of intelligence. Have you seen the same situation before in some other way? Does it remind you of something else? Can you associate this with this? Do you see that that is nothing else than this? This is one of the basic things of intelligence. Recognition of very different things are the same in some disguise. Well, if I were to install this analytic integration program and give the students the integration, fine. They'll now be able to cover analytic integration in much less time. But they will not have learned pattern recognition. When I cut the weights in half, should I not somewhere else put in the 250 pounds to lift? If the 250 pounds here are suddenly made 125 twice, had I not better put somewhere else in the class the 250 pound weight? Or am I cheating the students? It's a hard, hard problem. It's a very hard one. Now, there's a similar error made at the University of Chicago when I was there as a graduate student, undergraduate. They had an education department, and the education department ran a laboratory, which was really a grammar school and a high school. They took in students. They students paid some tuition, but fundamentally, these were vehicles to study. Well, they discovered what you all know, that you don't really read words by letters. You read them by syllables and other things. Oh, so they said, what the hell? If that's the way the students learn, let's teach it this way. So they did. And by God, the students did learn to read. Everything went along fine. They're now in late high school. And they're now coming to the thing about looking up words in dictionaries and other things. The kids don't know the alphabet. They never learned it. Well, at high school, can you make a child overlearn the alphabet so much that when you look at a dictionary, you can read backward and forward, you know which way to go where you've got a letter. Even when you're part way down the line, you still know whether to look forward or backward. I think you'll find that you cannot get 
the average high school student to so over memorize the alphabet that they can use dictionaries and telephone directories and so on. So consequently, something which seemed of no importance at the time, they left it out and it saved time, turned out to be almost fatal to those people. I've often wondered what that whole five or ten years of students going through the system, how they coped with life. Now you recognize that the alphabet ordering, which we use so many, like telephone directories, dictionaries and so on, we use many, is totally arbitrary. The items themselves do not have that order. We impose the order from the names of the items, and the names have nothing to do with the thing itself. If trees precede a follow bushes, it's because B is before tree, T, not because bushes precede trees in any other sense. They did a great deal of damage by not doing it, and I am very worried about the attempt to change what has been found to work and make a mistake like that. It's a Lulu. Now consider again what I've talked about last time, or the time before, in simulation. I give you war gaming or business gaming. Have I got the model right? In particular, business gaming. If we taught business gaming regularly to all business administrators, they would all know the other guy's strategy and therefore would know what the other guy would do and they could do something else and win. You see how, in some sense, you could not trust what you had learned in that way of behaving. Thus, if in military, if you want, if everybody is trained the same way, and this is how you do things all the time, and the guy learns how to do it, if you're a little smarter, you know, deviate from what you were taught. It'll ruin the other person. I did this to my brother. I'm sorry, my brother to me. I was playing chess when I was a young kid, and I was kind of bright and just to show off, I used to play him, I'd be blindfolded with my back to the chessboard on the beach, watching the pretty girl go by while he made the moves. And I'd say, okay, king bishop, queen bishop, four, something like that. And uh, I would win until he started making irregular, ridiculous moves. And then I collapsed. I couldn't do it. Now, if I was played enough, I could still do it. But basically, people who play chess blindfolded, Follow a standard pattern and notice small deviations. If the person plays a complete random game, you're in trouble trying to play blindfolded chess. Patterns are needed. You have to have them. So if you had wargaming and everybody learned the same wargaming, what you'd better do is not play a wargaming response. Otherwise, you'll probably lose. Now, let me close with some other observations about education. Several hundred years ago, the education in England was heavily Latin. You read Latin, you read Caesar, you read Latin poetry. Indeed, you were required to compose poems in Latin. You got a smattering of Greek, but it was a heavy education. There was no technical content with beans. It was a literary education. With this education, the English went out and created an enormous empire. The education you have, almost all of you, has nothing in common with that. Most of you probably can't do Latin. You probably have never written a Latin poem. You probably have, a couple of you do know Greek, of course, but uh, most of you couldn't do Greek. We give a completely different education now. There's negligible in common with what the classic education England was. I suggest to you the proper education in the year 2020 will be as different from what we're now doing as was that from us. Our education we've been giving for a while was very appropriate for the time we were living in. It was very appropriate for my background and what I did. But I can see vast holes in my education. Particularly, I was not given a humanistic attitude, and you've heard me say again and again, I found that the human factors and legal factors controlled what the technical decision would always work out to be. That the human factors dominated in many situations the actual engineering details. 
I've been stressing this all the way along. I learned it very slowly and painfully as I watched and marvel at why some projects succeeded and some other ones didn't. Having been there, I knew the technical decision. I knew why it should work and why it didn't. And I can give you one, for example. It's a very lovely one. Long ago, Bell Labs and AT&T started a picture phone experiment. It turned out to be a big disaster. AT&T lost a lot of money. But as a pilot study, Bell Labs did the following. They put a picture phone on each executive's desk. Every executive had a picture phone. We put, paid the cost to connect them all up and so on for experiment. And there was a button which you could set one way or the other. One showed on your screen what the other person looked like. The other showed what you looked like to the other person. So you could see just how you looked. Then we went around sometime later, three or four months in, and we looked. Almost all the executives had set the switch so they could see what they looked like. They were not looking at the other person. The other person was not looking at them. You're really not surprised when I tell you, are you? When I reveal what really happened, you know that's what did happen. I'm not lying to you. I'm not making it up. We were not smart enough. We didn't know humans enough, so we could have saved that whole damn experiment if we'd known human behavior. I say the engineering education we usually gave to people like me lacked very much the human side of the education. What the future one is going to be, I'm not sure, but I do not think that what we're now fiddling around with, tinkering with this and that, trying to change it a little bit here, there, and yon, will do the trick. Somehow or other, something else will go up. Now, what happened at Oxford and Cambridge? It was other schools came up and started doing the job that they slowly responded with more technical education. Very slowly. The classic ones, as they call it, Oxbridge. The classic education in England responded very slowly. Other institutions started doing it. Trade schools and so on did it. And I suspect that the uh, universities will find themselves in the same way. They are really badly out of date for the education you need for the year 2020, which is about 25 years from now, but is where you really are going to be making your big decisions which will affect society. The ones you make along the way are a nuisance. You can blunder here, there, and yon. But when you're in the top and you make mistakes, they are extremely expensive. So coming back to computer-aided instruction, I want to summarize it. Yes, insofar as we are talking about training, I think computer-aided instruction will be a big help. Insofar as we're talking about education, I doubt that they will do any good. In fact, I think they'll do more harm than good. This school, according to all the admirals I've had so far over to dinner, they've all said it's either 60% education, 40 training, or they've said 70% education, 30 training. They do not think that this place is a training place. They think it's an education place. The faculty frequently acts differently. This course is an attempt to educate you, not train. I told you repeatedly, there's no real content. I don't care whether you learn about digital filters or not. I tried to tell you how things work. I'm trying to educate you. But I admit, I don't know what the education person is, and I don't know how to do it other than what I've been doing, telling you a lot of anecdotes and stories of how I saw things work out. Is Rather than what they were supposed to do, they worked out this way. And amazing things happened. I guess I didn't tell you one amazing ones. There was, in the Nike project, a lovely ramp built at great expense, along with a blue room where admirals could sit, or generals, and they could watch. This great big analog computer was there, a big, huge one those days. And the idea was you'll bring in a fin or a gyro, and we will connect it up and simulate the whole rest. And we can test how the fins work, how the gyros work. We do every one of these things. And I thought that was a great idea. Jesus, it seemed great. Now, since they had that big analog computer there, and I was involved in computing, I was frequently over there getting some technician to unsolder the solder joints they had made and solder them some different ways, so I had a different computer. After all, the same raw parts were there, and I was constantly using the machine as a poor general purpose analog computer. 
solving military problems, so they had to do it. I wasn't cheating at solving Bell Lab problems, I was solving military problems, but I was solving different ones than that particular Nike on the Nike equipment. So I knew what went on. I was there one day a week, typically every Thursday. I had friends who were busy trying to wire up the post for connecting the gyro. When it was all over, and I was being thoughtful, let's see now, what happened to this whole Nike project? Hmm, gee, that happened. Now. Suddenly I realized I had never seen a part brought in and tested. Never mind the work that I put in, I had never seen one. So me being me, which you know is a bastard, I went around to various bosses along the way and said, you were going to do this. You were going to bring in some fins and test them. How come you didn't? Well, I got an alibi. I asked the guy about gyros. How come you didn't? Each guy I talked to, boss up line, why didn't they do this thing? With this carefully prepared ramp and everything else all prepared to do this thing, they didn't do it. Their excuses were different. I came out of the realization that you don't test equipment that way. You test it some other way. Well, this is what I mean. Things are not what they seem to be at all. You think, that, of course, that was a great idea. Of course, what could have been better? I was flatly wrong. I thought it was a great idea. I was looking forward to seeing how it was going to work out. It didn't. Psychologically, it was something else entirely. And this is what I'm troubled with, that we tend to tell you how engineering should work. And we don't understand enough about the psychology of engineers, the psychology of technically trained people, to see that they don't really behave the way they're supposed to be behaving. Let alone the other nuts who are not trained technically. They're even worse. But technical people don't behave rationally according to their own criteria. I should be preparing you. I should be teaching you psychology and other things. If only I knew what to do, but I don't. So I can only tell you anecdotes to tell you things don't work out the way they're supposed to. They don't even work out logically. So it's the best I'm doing. Next time I'll take up the subject of uh, mathematics and I'll talk about quantum mechanics and we're drifting along happily. And there'll be one more lecture on uh, what amounts to epistemology tucked in somewhere. Okay.